Vaigiji Kakasa, Vaigiji Gifote. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Media Watch. I'm your host, Dr. Savvy, and uh, we have another home edition, and we've got some wonderful guests with us this time around. Trying to pick some topical subjects, uh, things that will really kind of, uh, I guess it's things that you need to think about right now amongst the COVID crisis that we're all in. Well, my two guests are Jitender uh, Pala. He's a wonderful friend of mine. Uh, he's a person that leads the way in sociology. Uh, more importantly, uh, he is a gentleman who uh, helps entrepreneurs uh, with digital strategies online. Uh, and also the wonderful uh, Joe uh, Sidhu, uh, also a personal friend of mine. Uh, wonderful to see you. Waigi Kasa, Waigi for there. And uh, Joe... Uh, so Joe is a uh, QC, uh, and uh, I'll, I won't steal his thunder. He's done some incredible stuff. Uh, he um, is always a, an amazing guest to have on, very knowledgeable. Now, the topics that we're going to cover today are effectively three main themes. We want to talk about are scientists always right, um, especially when it comes to setting up policy. And then as the lockdown now starts to ease, we have the situation where people are talking about, you know, track and trace. Well, what does track and trace actually mean? It means to test people uh, and why other countries are being successful in terms of controlling the virus. Uh, it's because they've had a system in place where they're able to very quickly find out who it is that has uh, the particular virus um, and they self-isolate uh, and go for strategies behind that. I think the government has hired something like 21,000 people to follow that up. I have to admit to you that it does sound a bit like 1984 from George Orwell, but I'm not going to say any more than that. Um, and other countries, as we see, have, have done that. So the third thing really to talk about really is in this digital era that we are now about to enter, and literally just talking to Joe just a second ago, um, he's been conducting his work, uh, some of it from home, his consultancy, as well as the law cases he's doing using uh, technology that's available like Zoom and video conferencing. Um, and there's a lot of concern about also uh, the fact that the technology, is it really, truly, truly secure? Uh, Jatinda is an expert in that area. And, you know, uh, we really want to have uh, some legal uh, aspects of uh, civil liberties, really, uh, from my guest, Joe. So I'll address the first question to, uh, to Joe. Joe, tell us, um, are we right to believe the scientists in terms of how policy is being set up uh, as we're moving through this crisis? And by no means are we out of the, the woods yet for it. Uh, Savi, I think when most of us who have been watching the briefings from the Prime Minister and various other ministers in the government from the very beginning of this crisis, we wanted to actually believe that what we were being told was entirely true and correct. We are members of the public who rely upon our government and upon the expert advisors that they are taking advice from in order to make really important decisions about our own lives. When we were told that we must stay at home in order to protect the NHS and to save lives, we did that because we were assured that by staying at home, we would be able to stop the spread of this horrible virus. And government ministers repeatedly and the prime minister himself told us that they were acting on the advice of their scientific advisors. But as time has gone on, Savi, I don't know about you, but I I've got the feeling that the public's become increasingly sceptical about the advice that's being given. Each time you see one of these very senior advisors appearing on the press briefings and they're answering questions from journalists, which are very difficult searching questions, and rightly so, because the journalists are the eyes and ears of the public. I find some of these scientific advisors almost speaking to a script and it's as if that they have been told before they come on screen, don't say anything that's going to embarrass the government. If there are those which are unhelpful in the sense that they show that the UK is doing worse than other countries, and we know that we are doing worse than country in Europe, then please in some way uh, massage those figures or present them in a way that doesn't alarm people and doesn't create hostility towards this government. And, and so as time has gone on, and the journalists have been probing. Very importantly, just the journalists, but other scientific advisors outside the government. We're finding as members of the public that we're listening less to the government and their advisors and more to people outside. Let me give you a simple example. Some of you who've been uh, watching what's been going on will have noticed that there's a particular professor who works at Edinburgh University, and she's actually of Indian origin. And her name is Dr. Devi Shridhar. 
and Dr. Devi Shridhar is the Professor of Global Public Health at Edinburgh University. She's been publishing a lot of information. She's been writing articles for The, for the Guardian and appearing on television on Newsnight and other programs, talking about her concerns that actually what the government's telling us is wrong and that the scientific advisors who are feeding the government this information are not being as objective as they should. And so I think the real issue is this. We need to trust the science. We are, most of us, rational people. You know that I work as a barrister, and in courts, we always rely upon evidence rather than supposition or hearsay or tittle-tattle. And so it's really important that we have objective, reliable, verifiable information provided by scientific people who are senior enough and who have the integrity for us to be able to trust them. And the minute we lose that trust, we will stop following the advice. Do you think that transparency is also important too? Because I mean, consider, for example, the SAGE committee that meets. Uh, this is a scientific advisory group. Um, I can't remember what the E stands for. But effectively, what you've got there is a set of meetings that take place with scientists. They're making decisions. But I hear that some of those minutes are not necessarily made publicly available. So how can we trust? I mean, we may not understand all of it, but the fact that there should be transparency in whatever's been discussed uh, is important as part of the case for making sure that your underlying uh, decision making is clear and uh, leads to policy. Um, and But I see what you're saying, that sometimes policy can contradict and sometimes policy can be manipulated by politics as well. Uh, and people that are stating those things. In order for us to trust uh, the government and to trust their scientific advisors, we need to have honesty. We need to have integrity, meaning that the people who are telling us these things are not simply saying it to please the government. And watch out, these advisors that you see on screen doing the press briefings, just watch in about six months how many of them are uh, given some sort of public recognition in the Queen's Honours lists. I wonder how many of them have been promised that they'll be made a dame or a lord or knighted for their services to the country. And maybe that's why they're not actually doing the job they should and being brutally honest with the government and with the public. But we also need transparency and accountability. And that means you're absolutely right. The, the actual details of what's discussed within SAGE is important to be made public, not because you or I or the person next door is gonna spend time reading those things, but because if they're made public, Savi, then the journalists and the scientists working outside the government can scrutinize that material and say whether or not they feel those advisors are on the right track or whether the government is some way, in some way manipulating the message that's being put out. There's also the danger of simplifying everything as well, that everything is brought down so that everyone can understand it. There's an R number, we have to control the R number. Um, there's all these issues associated with whether or not kids go back to school or not on the 1st of June. And this brings me on to this next point. I'll bring uh, Jatinder in here. I mean, look, test and track, uh, test and trace effectively is probably the most important part of ensuring that if there is, and again, this virus is so uh, unpredictable, we don't know whether kids are carriers or not. Um, how can we be confident that, I know you can have 21,000 people in the background doing all the tracing and but how can we confident, be confident that the technology is going to stand up? Because what I hear is that in order for it to work, you need 60% of the people that are using it to download the app in the first place. And plus also, if you are suffering, then you need to be responsible to be able to put into the app the fact that you are suffering or having the symptoms and you need to self-isolate. And then the, the traceability kicks in. Do you not feel, Jatinda, that there's too many factors that we're relying on here? for the digital technology solution to actually work? Oh, it's an interesting one. I mean, uh, on, on that side of it, the first thing is that the future of, uh, like, the future of technology is healthcare, right? This is where a lot of the uh, big giants like Amazon, Google, um, they're all going, is in that direction, right? So this is um, a good time for them to actually see what they can do to create systems or technology that is reliable. The problem we have here yeah, is how that data is actually tracked and what we're giving consent to that could be utilized in their data mining, right? So everything that happens, like Joe was saying, we need the data, you know, and if we don't have the data, we can't see the trends or the patterns. So it's very important that um, the way that the tracking is done 
is is done properly. But it can be done because if you look at it's funny like if you look at some dating apps for example and some networking apps they like uh, you know they have certain things where um, if the other person also got the app and you've been in the vicinity it can flag it to say well this person was in range uh, do you want to connect with this person so the technology is there to be able to you know put input it um, you look at ways for example you know the navigation systems where everyone who's got the app is sending the you know the locations down so you can actually see where things are or, or, or what's going on it's like i said the problem comes down to you know the the privacy e element around it. it's like what data do they need how are they going to use that data um and, and the consent around that yeah so i mean again i mean gdpr is a big issue associated with you know privacy of information and permissions and the rest of it uh, joe are we are we um should we be confident that the data which apparently gets deleted afterwards um is actually truly going to disappear or you know you hear about all these countries where people are trying to hack into information we've seen the cambridge analytica problem in the past where people try to find out what your personal preferences are and they're trying to influence you are we really that free to be able to believe that the the confidence we talk about confidence the confidence in technology will certainly deliver i still think there's an issue about different age groups who will be able to use it i think there's an issue so a digital divide i think that there's an issue that unless you get a massive number of people using this you are not going to get the success rate that you that you really need you need over 60% of the people downloading the app and actively um, getting involved with it and you know i suppose that you know if it was built into social networks maybe that that would make it work but i don't think it does they're very separate applications aren't they they are, and I think there are a number of issues here and different layers of it. First of all, uh, Savi, as Jatinda says, we're, we're talking about what sort of a system you're going to institute today. And so this begs different questions which have legal, and you're right to say, Savi, is questions of privacy as well. Why are we as a, as a people, as a country, cynical about data? How many of us have not ever had had a phone call from a company that says we understand that you have a traffic accident and we'd like to help you with what happened. The issue of data harvesting, sharing, and data sharing has become a, a big problem for us as a society, not just because it makes us uneasy that our personal private data is being seen and revealed to people who have no right to see it, and that may include health records as well, which are very personal to us, but also because we don't know what governments leave with. We've got central governments who may have an agenda to centralize information. We have massive corporations like Facebook, and then we have Cambridge Analytica who have been harvesting information to collect uh, personal profiles about each of us. Then we have foreign powers, whether it's Russia interfering with the American elections, or it's China getting involved through Hawaii or others, trying to interfere with what's going on domestically in our countries. We have a reason to be nervous. Look, we're living in a global community and we share a lot of information with other people, friends and family, whether it's through Facebook or anything else, but we do so voluntarily. We have the right to expect that our data is being protected. Now the government has said, in order to combat COVID-19, we need to collect data. And you guys are absolutely right to say, well, that's easy to say, but unless you've got a smartphone and unless you get to a critical mass of number of people who are participating, it's not going to work. And you will have noticed that actually in the last week or so, the government has rolled back from saying having this app is fundamental to the battle against COVID-19 to now saying, actually, it's a nice add on, but we've really got an army of volunteers going out there doing track and trace and then isolating people through quarantine. So the government shift because the government hasn't sorted its position out and it's getting nervous. The minute the government suggests something, there will be a huge community of people, lawyers like myself and experts in the scientific community like Jatinder, who will turn around and say, hang on, is this actually A, workable, and is it in fact legal? So simple example, the app that we've been talking about, the question is whether it should be decentralized, which may well be legal, or centralized, which may not be legal because it breaches Article 8, which is the right to privacy under the European Convention of Human Rights, because we are giving over information which we then now have no control over. That's why it brings in GDPR issues. And so when we're talking about sharing information, which is collected through these apps on our mobile phone, where is the information going? It's going to the Department for Health and Social Care. 
it's going to local authorities, it's going to other agencies involved in health provision, but it's also going to the private sector that the government has brought into this battle against COVID. And that private sector, once they've got uh, possession of your information, are probably going to be less able to control than, say, a government department. So I think it's really important. I think but the, the simple point, I think, Savi, is this. The way in which this whole COVID crisis has been handled has been a from beginning to last. And the reason why it's been a disaster is because this government has not thought through its position about when to go into lockdown. It should have been earlier. It should have been harder. It should have been more aggressive. And then when they realize they've messed up, they start going into a different agenda, a different strategy, which then says to us, we've got to track and trace. We've got to have an application. We've got to recruit volunteers. The whole thing it does not leave you with any sense of confidence. And therefore, there's no surprise that the public say, do you really want me to download when you as a government have not given me confidence as an individual citizen that you're handling this crisis correctly? I think there's a, there's another layer as also, I think you're right, uh, the private companies make it a bit complicated. Um, and um, it's there's this case of, are they going to use it for marketing data later on? But it's lies at stake. And I think one of the things I've read recently is, the lack of international cooperation, right, between, you know, developing this app. You know, one country is using one technology, another country is using another technology, where it makes it difficult. So we do live in an era at the moment, even though there are quarantine factors that are going to kick in with regards to flying between countries. But ultimately, if we want to return to where we were before, where you can fly from one country to another, and if you do happen to be a carrier or you've had a problem, uh, there would be an easy way internationally across those boundaries be able to track and trace. So I think countries are being quite selfish in terms of technologies that they're choosing. They're not interoperable necessarily across boundaries. It does add an additional complication in terms of data laws. In California, there isn't necessarily the, the GDPR aspect in the UK and the European Union. Uh, there's even down to things like in Germany, the German Workers' Council, there's a data that you can't hold outside of that country. Um, there's all kinds of complications, but essentially it's about health. Right, but it is, but the, it's a global pandemic, needs a global response, but where you can't get Absolutely. a global response because you've got people like President Trump in the US who are in a state of denial about this for his own reasons. You've got a prime minister in this country who doesn't know what he is doing and seems to be jumping from one position to another. The best thing to do when you cannot get a global response uniformly across the whole of this planet under the aegis of the World Health Organization is to at least look at best practice. Look at best practice. Look at the countries that have dealt with this pandemic most effectively. Countries like Germany, New Zealand, South Korea, Vietnam, the list goes on and on. And if you look at countries like Germany, for example, the app that they've been using has been decentralized, not centralized. And they have had such a huge benefit to their strategy in keeping the deaths down, we as a country, let's be honest, are run by people who, broadly speaking, are quite arrogant. So you have people like Dominic Cummings saying, well, all of you have got to stay at home, but I will drive up to Durham and I don't really care what you think about it. There is, I'm afraid, a different form of infection going our it's arrogance. Arrogance infects our system. Sadly speaking, Britain sometimes, you do get the feeling as an ex-colonial uh, empire still thinks that it is the best in everything. And it doesn't have the humility to look at other countries and say, actually, we are not doing this the right way. Why don't we adopt the method used by the Germans or the New Zealanders or the South Koreans and actually get this thing under control? And sometimes as a human being who has a right to expect that I won't be infected and nor should my family, that my government is led by people who are willing to look across the face of the planet and say, who's getting this right? Why are they getting it right? Can we adopt the system that they've got rather than pretending that we always know better? So, Chitinder, uh, I wanted to ask you. Um, I just wanted to Sorry, say to that, uh, you know, there, there is a, a bit of a flip side on this as well, that in the sense like when we do marketing or launch new products, so we don't always know what's going to work. We have to do split testing and things like that. And what we're seeing with this, uh, this pandemic, <laughs> what we're seeing with this uh, happening at the moment is that it's new. It's something we haven't dealt with. Um, in the past, so the different countries are reacting in different ways, doing different things, which you could say is like a split test, right? Um, and the, the, we are trying to like cope with it in the best way we can. And human nature is that if we don't know something, we do have this internal panic. There are humans at the end of the day, they, they're trying 
you know, they have to look, manage the country, they have to manage the people, they have to, you know, do what's best for both sides. And sometimes that can put on pressures on the individuals that, who are involved. And that is something that needs to be, you know, um, something that we should empathize with. But then, like uh, Joe was saying, we should, as a global community, connect and share that information so we can actually see what the split test is actually telling us and how we can utilize the learnings from that to actually have a better solution. Like, you know, um, it's like, you know, Bill Gates was speaking about this stuff a couple of years ago, you know, and there's all sorts of stuff around that. But did anyone actually take on board what he was saying and say, well, if it did happen, what kind of things should we implement to actually minimize it as much as we can? And I think, so it's, it's a bit of, you know, there's that two elements, the two sides of it that are actually going on. And I reckon as a human race, we're going to have so much advancements coming from this as well. There's going to be so much things that technology wise, the way we connect, the way we do business, all sorts of things are going to change. And I think it's going to add value to people as well. I think you're right. I think there's going to be a changing way. People are now a lot more used to using video conferencing, like I was saying earlier on, or different ways to connect or even different ways to learn. I think your point's very good with regards to, uh, and, and Joe also, you know, best practice is important. Bring it together in one place. Now, it's interesting, there's a lot of movies that have kind of, you know, forecasted this kind of issue. And you mentioned the Bill Gates thing from 2015, the TED talk that he did. And then followed from that, there was a TED Connect in February. And he still insisted that the way to go out of this, get out of this situation is through testing. I think you brought an interesting point also, uh, Jatenda, that, you know, uh, and Joe as well, like how, what, what countries are successful at this? We know that South Korea are successful at it because when when they had that SARS issue, they um, were well equipped with their PPE stuff. They had uh, mechanisms in place to be able to track and trace. The danger I feel, and there's a term that's being used at the moment, which is called gas gaslighting, where you, in about six months time, it's and you were saying about people getting lordships, in six months time, it's like, oh, don't worry about it. You know, it was only a blip on the horizon that took place over three months. And then we'll go back into investing heavily in areas that don't affect the mass population. This should be a lesson. I mean, there's no, I, we've, we've only got a few minutes left, but I'd love each one of you to say, look, is this a lesson for us with regards to how we invest our money in the future? So that if there is a morphing of this disease and we're struck with this thing in two years time, another year's time, or heaven forbid that it gets worse in the winter months when you get influenza and some kind of a possible mutation, I'm not saying there is, but what can we do to better pre prepare ourselves um, as we move forward? I mean, uh, to you go first and then uh, Joe. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting, I mean, um, you know, none of this kind of stuff, you know, affect people, but everything's in, in hookum anyway, right? So um, if it was to happen again, we do have some sort of a blueprint now. I mean, people have seen this now. They've seen this whole thing about social distancing. If you want to say that program has been put into the human brain now, that if something like this was to happen, this is potentially what we could end up doing. And because we've gone through it, we're going to be familiar with it. So if it was to happen again, some of these things, we will probably end up being a lot quicker. Um, and uh, and it's like, you know, the, the other thing on, on that is we have to collect that data the best way we can and then utilize it to think what what yeah, can what infrastructure can we put in place just in case yeah, infrastructure happen. investment and joe i'll leave the worst last word with you because i literally got about a minute left thank you by the way just you tend to appreciate no. your time thank you. we've got to plan the one thing we've learned from this whole nightmare is that we didn't plan for it we should have done we had sars we had mers other countries planned we had ppe we lost the ppe we should have kept the ppe President Obama actually left a, a handbook for President uh, Trump as to how to deal with a crisis like this. That book was thrown out of the window. President Trump wasn't interested. Professor Shri, uh, Sridhar herself said two years ago, there's a video of this out there on YouTube. You're going to have a crisis like this. It's going to come from China. We need to be ready for it. We must plan. Planning is absolutely fundamental. What have we learned from this? We've learned that you can't trust your political leadership and you can't always trust your scientists. That, that means we we must empower ourselves with all the more informed. Some of us have now become almost like amateur biologists, epidemiologists. We've all learned so much from this and we have to take more responsibility for our health. But we are entitled to expect that our government will take the right decisions at the right time. And in a sense, what we have all learned from this is 
Make sure you keep pressure on your government. Don't always take what they say at face value. Ask the right questions. Have a healthy democracy in which we hold those in power over us accountable for their actions. Make sure we've got a healthy legal profession who can take the government to court when they're doing something that's wrong. And we must make sure that the next generation doesn't face this. But I'm afraid to say, Savi, I think we're not seeing the end of this. It's just the beginning yeah. of a series it's a of bit, such I, I, I really hope that, you know, I mean, I, I, I really appreciate your time today. Um, wonderful, fantastic suggestions all around how best practice should work, how we should really be understanding more about policy, uh, transparency, honesty, uh, how digitally we're going to be challenged in the future. Uh, and uh, these challenges will continue. But like the human race doesn't learn from its past, but hopefully this time it will. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thank you for that.